could ask a question in the chat, please. And then Dave, if uh, if you could repeat the question, if they can't hear me when I repeat the question or let you know <laughs> that the question is happening. And then either one of you are going to read me the question? Yeah, okay. yeah, that'll happen. Okay, thank you. All right, hey, how are you? Um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'll, I always start my talks and thank you, Courtney, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and Amy, thank you for everything you're doing in this place. Um, my name is Dave DeWitt. I have now, this will be my 37th year farming in Truro. Um, it's been quite a, a journey. I've also spent a fair amount of time uh, farming in California, Northern California, where I went to college, um, and a little bit down in Southern California, where I lived for a little bit. Um, so the, uh, the wonderful world of farming and gardening is based with soil. Soil is gonna be the beginning of all of that, um, is, is the essence of everything we do um, in gardening and farming. I, most of you are just gardeners, correct? Any market gardeners? Any farmer wannabes? So mainly we're talking about gardeners, okay? I'm gonna give you a little um, uh, warning. This talk that I've given here is geared towards a bunch of sciencey farmers who've already had their soil science degrees. Um, so we are going to, I'm gonna kind of real quickly now kind of just talk to you about the basis of soil and and how it's important and what you know the general concept of organic gardening i am an organic farmer i'm actually now a what everyone wants to call a regenerative farmer um regenerative agriculture um i am a soil smith through so i uh i'm allowed to teach i now practice korean natural farming on my farm this will be my wow fifth season solely as a korean natural farmer um, and that'll be my very last talk that I'm in the series called Beyond Organic. Um, so I want to, um, I have my uh, degree in plant and soil science from Northern California, uh, College of the Redwoods and Humboldt State University, um, and have been very uh, blessed to be able to have access to land in Truro. I started off farming um, in Truro in 1987. Uh, with a gentleman named Arthur Tubner, an acupuncturist in Provincetown. Some of you may have met him. Uh, and uh, he always wanted his land to be turned into an organic farm, but was an acupuncturist and was serving the, the people of P-Town at the time in Orleans. So he never had enough time to get it all done. And I was looking for land to start kind of getting my hands in the ground with my own business. Um, I had been working for years on orchards and other farms and flower farms, all sorts of different types of farms, yet none of them were my own. And some were organic, some weren't. Um, some were animals, some weren't, you know. So I, through the years, uh, and I, you know, I started really young. Um, the luxury that I had with Arthur was that it was like an open slate of land and we turned it into a farm uh, at, at the time I finished farming there, we had a little over five acres of vegetable production um, in Truro, in North Truro off Castle Road um, with the nice little view of Cornhill Beach. And um, uh, Arthur was so gung-ho and is such a dear friend, spoke with him yesterday, as a matter of fact. And we together and my old um, girlfriend and very good friend now, Stephanie Ryan, who's another farmer in Truro, the three of us farmed it. And we just went from something about the size of this room. And then the next year we tripled it. And then the next year we quadrupled it. And then the next year, before you know it, uh, we were you know, full on. Um, we sold our plants and stuff at a farm stand that was located on Castle Road. But our primarily source of, um, of mark, our primary market was something called Community Supported Agriculture, CSA. Um, we had met this, uh, went to a conference, I guess that was in 86. We met this woman, Robin Van En, who brought the concept of community support agriculture to our country. It had been, uh, she had studied it in, uh, what's it, Switzerland? Switzerland and Japan, where the way it works, basically the consumer 
pays ahead of time for the farmer for a weekly share of the harvest. We end up calling them shareholders. I have one in the room today. Nicole is a, this year's newest shareholder. So um, she's paid ahead of time for 18 to 20 weeks of produce each week of what's in season because it's coming out of the garden that week. Um, it's a great concept. One I veered away from for a long time, but I've now found my way back again. Um, so I started the Orleans Farmer's Market back a long time ago and um, have been instrumental with an organization. I helped found Sustainable Cape, which runs the P-Town Market, the Wellfleet Market, and that's it, right, I think? Churro. Yeah, Churro and P-Town. Oh, yeah, there's Miss Sustainable Cape. Um, so Sustainable Cape is a great organization. If you don't know about them, you should really find out. There's amazing opportunities to help. Um, I was fortunate to come up with the, the Cape part as an acronym for um, Center for Agricultural Preservation and Education. But it has morphed into this just phenomenal organization that does a lot of work. Just check them out, sustainablecape.org. Um, so over the years, um, I've done farmer's markets. I've done restaurant sales. I've done direct sales off the farm. I had a little nursery stand on Route 6 for a few years when I took over uh, Rock Spray Nursery, the Heath and Heather Nursery that is where my farm is today. Um, so I've got a lot of experience with plants growing in greenhouses as a nurseryman. I've done worked on huge fruit orchards, uh, animals, organic, non-organic farms, cut flower farms, huge cut flower farms in Northern California. Um, but ultimately, I like to work for myself and to develop a relationship with the piece of land. So I've been currently, now I'm a, a Dave's Greens is, um, I've been there since 2005. I took over at Rock Spray Nursery from my old boss. Um, and my partner, Sebastian, and I have created this wonderful little place in the deep in the woods of Truro that um, still do nursery stuff, but predominantly vegetable production. Uh, my old farm manager is Uli Winslow. He grows mushrooms here on the Cape in Truro. And another young farmer there now, uh, Aaron uh, Hurst, who's Sketchy Greenhouse is the name of his. So there's actually three separate businesses, farm businesses on our property now, which is a dream that Sebastian and I kind of envisioned, um, utilizing this land to give younger generations like, an, like the same thing Arthur and I had when I was a 19, 20, 21 year old kid. So um, it's been very successful, um, maybe not financially, but in a lot of other ways it has been. Um, so that's about kind of my experience. Um, definitely have taught a lot. Um, I've talked to huge conferences on all sorts of subjects. Um, today's subject is the essence of your garden and the essence of our planet, and that's the soil. Without it, nothing, none of us are here, right? So in organic gardening, um, what we're ultimately trying to do is to mimic nature and to work with nature, okay? And we're kind of like in concert with the environment. So you're not like pushing and pulling too much, you're kind of melding and molding and shaping um, as opposed to, you know, at least in, in when it comes to organic gardening, you know, we're really working with nature. We're working with it in many different levels. Um, and when it comes to like a chemical grower, they can just put down some salt fertilizer and kind of push it. So I'm more into like the molding and the melding and the touching and the feeling of the soil and the, of the farming. Um, so soil is the main component of our dis discussion. And it's the name of the title is soil, compost and mulch. But it's really all about the soil. Okay, compost and mulch are just ways for us to enhance our soils um, and create what's called tilth. Tilth is the health of your soil. Okay, so you wanna build the tilth of your soil. Um, so in nature, you've all noticed um, when the leaves fall off the trees, they fall into the forest, they start to decompose. You can pull, a, pull the leaves across and maybe see some white little fuzz mycelium fungus, you could go down a little deeper, you might find some earthworms and you'll see some different type of components. So that's mother nature kind of working in a system, okay? So 
it's not just soil and the, the three components of soil, which we'll talk about in a second, but it's also plants. Okay, so we're going to talk about soil, but we're first going to talk about plants because plants have evolved over time to have a relationship with the soil and more importantly, the soil microorganisms um, that are living in the soil. So um, we're going to get a little sciencey now. And you can say, slow down and explain that if you want. I'm merely using my slideshow today as just notes to keep me on track. Um, I'm not very good at making PowerPoint presentations, but I think this one will be sufficient enough. Um, that's actually a picture, an old picture of a stand, my stand when I was on Route 6. Year, like That was probably 2000. I should update this photo. That's probably 2007 or 2008. Um, so I am known for my salad greens. Definitely, um, hence the name Dave's Greens. Um, my salad greens is typically uh, anywhere between 19 and 27 as my record ingredients in one bag of salad. So it's a, a unique thing, but I do grow eggplant and pepper. I mean, I you know, whatever we can get, uh, whatever, whatever is our fancy that year. All right, so here we go. Science class. Maybe, did I get the wrong button? Do I have to let's see here? This one? Yeah, I hit it. If I click on this, you think? Oh, that's so sad. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I have to get a light because I guess maybe Zoom is going. Um, who remembers that? Anyone remember that? Can someone say, tell me what it is? Anyone know what this, this chemical equation is? Photosynthesis. Okay. That's the key right there, folks. Without the sun, okay, um, which interacts with chlorophyll and plants, um, those are the two chlorophyll from the plants and the sun is what makes our world go around. Um, it provides us with protein, animal protein, um, all sorts of minerals. Um, everything revolves around that relatively simple equation, okay? Um, we're not going to get too in detail with that, but... Um, there it is, photosynthesis, and it has a relationship with soil. And that's the key thing that I want to talk about, is the plant's relationship with soil and what goes on underneath our feet in what's called the rhizosphere, okay? Photosynthesis. Okay, plants absorb H2O through the roots, right? The water comes through the roots, transports, uh, it gets transported in with, uh, with the chloroplasts um, to help create... Um, the chloroplasts then split the H2O molecules into atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. What happens with the oxygen? It's released, right? So we get to breathe it, ultimately producing um, NAPTH and, and uh, ATP, very important molecules um, to create something that's um, important. Carbon dioxide is absorbed through stomates, which are little holes on the leaf. Um, and that's how it gets its carbon dioxide. So once the, inside the chloroplast, the CO2 hits that with the NADPH and the ATP, that produces carbohydrates, okay? So energy, look, carbohydrates, that's just like what we eat, little energy bundles, right? Little like uh, sources of food, okay? And those carbohydrates are used for construction of the plant. They'll build the cell walls, they'll help um, do all, uh, unbelievable amount of work that the carbohydrates do. So. Um, very important that we have photosynthesis, um, plant reserves, yeah, two thirds of the carbohydrates go to something called exudate production. And that is the really important component because the word exudates you're going to learn about in a second, but two thirds of all that extra carbohydrates goes for plant exudates. Okay. So this is the real machine that runs the connection between the soil of the plants and the soil world is the exudates. Okay. Uh, they make so much food, they can feed the soil organisms a complex community. Exudates um, are, I think I'll probably have a whole slide on that, but um, exudates are basically carbohydrates and some sugars and other things, uh, molecules and um, amino acids and things that um, the soil organisms utilize in their process of their lifestyle and their life. So it's a way that the plants can communicate with the organisms in the soil. It's a symbiotic relationship, the plants and soils. Very important that they work together. 
So through the exudates is how plants can literally communicate with soil. Okay. It, it actually has a relationship to the point where a plant can say, I need some of this. And it can find the bacteria and the fungi that are going to go find that and mine it in the soil and bring it back. Actually, some bacteria will go through the mycelium of the fungi. Many, many, you know, I think as someone said three miles, I heard at one conference, I was at, but a long distance. So if it's not available locally, they'll send out the bacteria to go find those nutrients and bring them back to the plant. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a absolutely science fiction-y kind of way that plants communicate to the soil and all the rhizosphere and organisms in the soil, all based on photosynthesis, okay? Um, and the, and the uh, exudate production. Okay, so exudates are excessive carbohydrates. Like I said, it's mixed with hormones, fatty, like all sorts of organic acids, amino acids, um, other great compounds. And it makes this kind of sugary concoction um, a, a colleague of mine, um, and probably one of our premier soil scientists, Elaine Ingham, explained it to me once. It's like, um, exudates is like the cookie. It's like everyone loves dessert and sweets and cookie. And it's got like egg for pro some protein. It's got some carbohydrates. It's got some sugar, right? So that that draws in the bacteria and fungi and other organisms to the roots of the plants, okay? So... Um, the exudates are secreted through the plant roots, and then they feed like like cookies. Like it's like, exciting for these organisms to come and get it. Um, okay, so all seventeen essential nutrients that plant needs to exist in the soil um, is is in the soil. So when we're walking around, everything's there. It's just not available for plants. It's not in a usable form that can fit through the root membrane. If you kind of think of a jigsaw puzzle, certain chemicals you know, can go through that jigsaw puzzle and through the, the root membrane uh, and get up into the soil, into the plant. Um, but if it's not in a reusable form, the plant can't use it, um, although it's right here. Okay, so there's lots of calcium. We're standing on it, particularly in Cape Cod, um, but it all can't, it's not available to our plant. So it needs those roots to um, break up and get the, util to, to get those nutrients, break it down into a, a, a mineral, um, the roots, then break it down, uh, use the bacteria and fungi, break down the minerals so they can utilize it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so another really cool thing that happens with the um, exudates is that plants um, can then absorb certain types of bacteria that have extracted nutrients into the plant. So the bacteria actually goes into the plant. Endophytes are called. Um, and in that, they protect the plant, they bring in nutrients, and they begin to give the plant a um, defense system, maybe you want to think of it that way, um, from internally inside the plant. Um, Dr. James White is Rutgers University. If you ever want to go down the rhizophagy uh, um, endophyte things, that's the person to look up. <laughs> um, so soil microbes, bacteria, fungi, arachni, et cetera, like nematodes, diatoms, protozoas, I mean, all the things that we remember from our kind of beginning biology classes um, are uh, equipped with special enzymes that will break down the nutrients from the soil and organic matter. Organic matter is not soil. It's something different, okay? Um, it's something that was once living. It doesn't become soil until it goes through the whole process. But um, what brings those nutrients from the soil are the bacteria and the fungi and all those other microorganisms, okay? And water, moisture helps break that stuff down too. But it's um, really, that's the critical component. Plants are sending out the exudates, the exudates are bringing in the bacteria and the fungi the plant needs to grow. They break down the nutrients that that specific plant, rosemary, tomato, cherry tree, dahlias, whatever it is, those roots are producing specific exudates for what they need. So it's a, it's phenomenal what's really what's really going on under our feet. Um, so I want to get back. I want to back track it just one quick second. Um, soil is um, composed of three elements basically: physical components, sand in our case, silt, clay. Okay, loam is like kind of the perfect mixture of all of them. If you hear the word loam, you're kind of like 
get all three of those in a perfect thing and you got like a loam. Um, you can have sandy loam, which is what I have. Um, so um, so you have the physical component, the actual physical stuff, okay? Then you have the chemical components, calcium, magnesium, boron, okay? All those other things that we've learned about in Chemistry 101, okay? Um, and then, you know, I like the chemistry, I like the physical stuff, but I really dig the biology, right? Like for me, I'm a bio, I'm like, biology just blows my mind. So soil is composed of biology too. So you have all those microorganisms and all that stuff going on, but without all three of them working together, we don't live. The, we, you know, our planet doesn't exist, okay? So it, those three components are all there. The minerals, is the boron and the magnesiums and the molybdenum, that's all in the physical parts, the sand, silt, and clay. Um, obviously in our case, on our sandbar, it's a lot of sand, um, but we're also blessed that, you know, we have an extreme diversity of minerals in our soil. So we're very lucky that way. We just have to learn some tricks to get it out into our garden. Okay. Yeah, it seems like, um, okay, so microbes die and are consumed by predators, like, you know, nematodes or earthworms. Um, and then when those organisms die or when they, like in a case of an earthworm, poop out their what they've consumed, those are available nutrients to most plants. That's That's part of the process. The bacteria have to grow, eat it, get it, die through another organism and then then it's in, uh, able to go through the root membrane so um they're basically nutrients are gathered are they're left behind and they're ready to go for the plants exudates nourish that soil micro microbial life that's that cookie thing right it's like the exudates is like hey come to me i'm going to give you some food so it can actually multiply so it's some bacillus bacteria get in there and a little bit of some kind of different fungi get in there and then there are a certain number, certain level of product. And then all of a sudden they get fed like a cookie and they just start to multiply right there in the root zone in the rhizosphere. Okay. So the exudates, once again, it's just, it, it just does a complete system. It actually increases the life that it needs so that the plant can get the nutrients that it needs so it can survive. Like if we left our planet alone, everything would probably be fine, but we kind of messed it all up by being humans. So, um, but things were going good evolution I, evolutionary wise, you know, for a while. Um, one of the other great things that can happen is that uh, exudates can alter the pH in your soil. Okay, pH is important because certain bacteria and fungi want to be in a, in a in a in a range of pH where they can do their most benefit. And if you look at um, if you ever see in a nutrient chart of the plant nutrients, and you look at um, aside from things like blueberries and things like that that want to be on the acidic side of things, but if you look at those charts. The most available nutrients is in the 6.3 to 6.8 range of pH. So at that range, most of the nutrients are available. We can apply lots of phosphorus, let's say, into our soil. But if that pH is not right, it's going to be in a different form, in a chemical equipped form, and not going to be go through that root membrane like that, that piece, um, that puzzle piece to fit in there. So very important that your pH is right. That being said, the entire Northeast is acidic soil. Um, it, it's not until you get like, well, I mean, there's obviously pockets of alkalinity here and there, but generally speaking, the Northeast is a acidic place. So we have to learn to work with it. And we have amendments we can use like limestone, which adds the calcium carbonate to make that transition and change the pH. Um, but exudates do it too, right? So now I'm a Korean natural farmer and I'm working on getting my soil in balance in a different way. But part of that process is we don't have to add limestone to our fields anymore. We can now let the balance of the soil and the microorganisms do all that pH buffering and get the pH balanced where it needs to be for the plants that are growing in that spot. Yes, Courtney. How do I know what pH my soil is? Is there like a Tests there are rapid tests that you can buy at our local nurseries. They're pretty much junk in the big picture. Um, it will give you a general idea because it's the little pin's going to go bing and you're going to be acidic. There are a little bit more extensive tests um, with some reagents, just like your chemistry class and your little litmus dipping thing and that kind of thing. And you're comparing colors, right? That's kind of a little bit 
better than the rapid one. That's a little bit next level. But honestly, nothing beats a soil test. Even if you're a home gardener. I mean, it, it's good to know what you have. Um, you may have absolutely nothing in your soil. Um, and that is the case out of most of our soils here. Unless you're really, really actively composting and mulching and doing things to really build up our soil here. Um, because our sandy soil is so has so much what's called macro pore space. We have a lot of oxygen in our soil. We have a lot of pore space for oxygen to get in there. Oxidizes organic matter very quickly. Okay, so if we put some compost in Arcata, California, where I went to college, which is predominantly clay, and I dump some compost on, it takes a long time for that to kind of go through the whole process because it has micro pore space, not macro pore space. If I put the same amount on my soil here, it can literally be gone in one season. Okay, so um, a lot of my clients will be and folks that I meet will be like, oh, well, yeah, we put some compost on when we did the house. Bayberry came and brought us some compost. And I said, well, when was that? And they're like, well, you know, 22 years ago. I'm like, well, you don't have compost there anymore. So it's completely gone. So the key um, for us is to take a soil test, get your pH, get your organic matter content, you know, and then you can see that. But it's also going to give you your macro and micronutrients. So you're going to know if you're deficient in phosphorus or potassium or sulfur or calcium or molybdenum or whatever else the plant needs to grow. So um, it's going to give you like, hey, I, I don't want to spend money on phosphorus fertilizer if I'm if I'm high in phosphorus. So then you're going to you can kind of curtail your fertility program with your soil test. Um, I. I'm a little bit of a soil geek, so I take three soil tests a year, but predominantly I, as a home gardener, I would, um, if you're just getting started and you, you want to know what it is now, then take a soil test now or in the early spring and you'll get a, an idea. But unfortunately, to make some real changes in that soil, you need some months ahead of the time. So um, there's a whole chemical process that has to go down with this exudates and everything to break up and make nutrients available organically. If you're using chemical fertilizers, it's like an intravenous in the vein, just feed the plant with what it needs to grow and uh, ignore the soil. That's at that, you know, if you're a chemical grower, the soil is only there to anchor your plant. That's really it, you know. Um, so, but with organics, we use amendments that have to break down and go through a process to be available. And that takes sometimes six, eight, nine months. You know, it's like a long time. So, um, I, I think the most effective and the best time for soil sample is in the fall because that's after you've grown a crop and you've mined up the nutrients that were there. So you're looking at your soil in kind of its mined out state where it's going to be least. If you do it in the middle of the summer, you've been fertilizing, you've got, or at least in my case, you're using green manure cover crops and cover cropping. So you're actually building soil. So it's, it gives you a little bit of a skewed number. Um, at this point, I wouldn't bother with the biological soil test. I would just go for the chemical test, which is your nutrients, your pH. It'll give you a breakdown of your sand silt, but around here, it's going to come up sand. Where do you need that? Locally here, you're going to use West Lab, UMass Amherst West Lab. Okay, thanks. And then the other, anywhere you are, the one of the best labs to go to is called Logan, Logan Labs. And I want to say they're in Ohio, but I can't remember. But Logan Labs is like really good. You know, West, I mean, you know, that Amherst is great too. So it's kind of, I don't want to knock them either. But, um, and it's also that, you know, when you send that soil sample in, you want to like tell them what you're growing. I grow roses. I grow peonies. I grow raspberries. I grow whatever. I grow Heath and Heather. You know, that, those, that makes a difference of the recommendations they're going to give you. Because if they're like, I grow vegetables, then they know you want to be in that 6.3 to 6.8 range. So they're going to give you recommendations for what tomatoes need to eat, you know, and, and flowers and stuff like that. So um, important to add that in your soil test. Okay. So exudates alter pH and other elements in the uh, environment around the roots. And when they do that alteration, they then free up those nutrients um, for your plants. So I can't tell you how much I love exudates. Um, they, they'll attract specific microbes because if they need phosphorus, they're going to get the microbes that are going to get the mind of the phosphorus. Okay. They're going to find out what they need from the plants going to tell them. 
and they're going to get the specific microbes to do the work, okay? Um, another cool thing that happens with exudates is they can repel the, like, they can have a little biological warfare in the soil. Like, if there's some pathogens, i.e. soil, you know, late blight, early blight on your tomatoes, septoria, these kind of things that are kind of like in the soil and not really great for your plants. Well, the plants, through its exudates, can pull in the bacteria in the flora that will then combat the pathogens, plant pathogens, not human pathogens, but plant pathogens um, and other diseases. Um, and that's basically that's an aleopathic relationship. A, a great uh, aleopathic plant, if you've ever been to California and seen eucalyptus growing, eucalyptus puts off these really cool chemicals from the roots and it kills off all other plants around it. So it has no competition. Right. And then, so it's like, I'll just kill everything. So if you go to like a eucalyptus grove in California or where that's where I've seen them, there's like nothing growing underneath them. Very, very few things can do it. Um, so it's creates its own environment. I am very fortunate. I, um, I get all of the grape pressings and all the uh, extra stuff from the churro vineyards from my friends and they bring it to my farm and we compost it. So in the process of all that, the last thing to break down in the compost is the, the grape seed, okay? And we have noticed anecdotally, and I've yet to find out any like written papers, white papers, but when we use the grape compost in areas on the farm that still have a lot of seeds, like you can literally just, like 10, 12 years later, dig in my soil and find little grape seeds. Um, they seem to have had a slight um, aleopathic with broadleaf weeds, ragweed, chickweed, a few other, you know, certain other weeds that we have, not the grasses. It doesn't seem to do anything to them, but this is all totally anecdotal. And Uli and I have just, our minds looking at it, and but we can see where that, that specific compost is gone. It is keeping weed pressure down. Now, weed pressure is going down on my farm for a lot of other reasons. So there's, you know, we don't have a controlled experiment, but um, there can be some cool aleopathic uh, results from our exudates. Um, okay, generally speaking, the root exudates feed the soil, uh, the soil life, and then the soil life feeds the plant. Hence, the plant feeds us. So without these exudates, without these organisms, folks, we're all, we're all dead. We're not here. We don't exist. Um, it's been a perfect evolutionary symbiotic relationship with the plant world and the mineral world. Okay, so you've got the minerals, physical structure of the plant and the chemical structure of the plant, and they break it down for plants to survive. Living soil. Well, that's a pretty simple term, yet hard to achieve all the time. Um, there's a Elaine Ingham, the renowned soil scientist um, coined a phrase called the soil food web, which is a little bit better in my picture than uh, living soil ideas, but um, the soil has to be alive. And you have to have biological diversity. You have to have all this stuff going on. You have to have fungi there, okay? If we just go dig on the sand, what are we finding? Just pretty much sand, right? It's just the physical property of sand. Um, we need to build that and then get it to be a living soil. We need to add things. We need to in encourage different things to grow. We need to um, get things going. So you can actually take pure sand and turn it into great soil. It just takes some time um, in the process. So the, the soil food web for me is that combination of the plants making exudates, the bacteria and fungi doing their thing, the amoebas eating the protozoas and the protozoas dying and the, um, you know, the nematodes the beneficial ones eating the, the you know, the non-beneficial nematodes. Um, most of this is all studied, obviously, with microscopes. Um, but living soil is the key to this, like, function. It goes back to my uh, discussion earlier about the forest, right? That, su that cycle that, that goes on. The leaves fall, they rot, they produce uh, nutrients for the plant, plant grows, drops, it's going on. So... All that happens with uh, life. So soil that's filled with micro, uh, microbial diversity and living plants, uh, ex um, the plant roots exchange nutrients, and that's part of the process. 
Plants produce phytochemicals that protect the plant. So plants can produce their own phytochemicals to resist insects. If it's a healthy plant, it'll, it can fight off aphids. It can fight off all sorts of things. Um, if it's not, and it's a weak plant due to weak soil and unbalanced soil, then you have pest outbreaks, okay? Um, and then when we eat plants, right? We get the phytochemicals help us grow and be strong and healthy and fight off our own uh, issues. Um, so the better the plant is able to access nutrients, the better it tastes and is more nutritious food as a more nutritious food source. This comes down to what's called the uh, nutrient density of the plant. Okay. Um, and uh, there's some great work done by, um, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. I can't think of his name. Um, the Bionutrient Association, you can find a lot of information out. Um, um, I, I'm blanking out on his name. Um, Dan, I can, God, he's a friend of mine, I can say, I can't even think. Um, so he's a farmer out in Western Mass, um, but he's done a lot of work with nutrient density in plants and looking at the right, like if you put two carrots together, both grown in churro, right? Both organic seeds, both organically grown, they're not the same. So he's actually created a, a beta uh, tester thing where you can actually test that carrot at the farmer's market when you're there and see how biodense and nutrient dense it is. And then you can make your decision like, am I going to buy Degrees carrot or am I going to buy Murph's carrot? And you can figure out whose are better. Now, to get it to, you know, beta number, you know, the the the, the real handy version, he I think he only needs another quarter million dollars. He's on, a, you know, he's in his big million dollar fundraising thing. I think he's down to like a quarter million dollars. So the Bionutrient <laughs> Organization Association, if you want. But eventually, I, I would guess within probably the next 10 to 15 years, and there's some other people working on it too, there's going to be a device you can buy. You can go to the stop and shop and compare everything up and down the thing. Which head of lettuce has the most nutrient? Which tomato has the most nutrient? Okay. So um, all plants aren't created equal and, it, equal, and it has to do with the exudates, the biological activity in the soil, and if it's balancing the soil and getting all the nutrients it needs. And then we eat those and we get those nutrients. So it's really important for us to grow a nutrient dense uh, food as, as, you know, as far as farmers go and, and in your home garden. Living soils and more. Yep. It's, once again, photosynthesis doing its thing. Carbon sequestration, you hear about that all the time, right? Because we have a little excess of carbon in our planet right now. Um, best way of securing carbon is in the soil. Okay. There's actually an exchange that goes between, it, it, it releases soil carbon too, but it's a whole process uh, that can help sequester carbon. Um, if you have a real active soil and it's really dialed in and things are cranking, you're sequestering more carbon than that someone that doesn't have that and it's not cranking. So our goal, once again, is to work in unison with nature, mimic it, get get find that balance and really work with nature to get uh, sequester carbon. I mean, there's now there's farms saying like, you know, I can I can do some math and some kind of, you know, equations and figure out how much carbon my farm sequesters, you know. And bigger farms, particularly like regenerative farms in the in the Midwest and in large advances of land, are you know big companies are getting their carbon credits from these farms, right? So like, you know, it's offsetting and it's helping the farmer offset well a little bit too. So um, it's a game, political game, but it um, it's you know the more we focus on soil, regenerative agriculture is that cycle. Okay, it regenerates itself. So by by fostering a good soil health, by fostering a living soil and a biological rich soil, you are cranking, you're turning up the engines on that system between the plants, the soil, and the atmosphere. Plant, soil, atmosphere, all around in a circle. It's a regenerative. It goes around in cycles. That's pretty much what it means. I mean, there's a lot of like definitions now that I don't know the actual definition of, but it's a very catchy phrase right now, and everyone wants to be a regenerative farmer, but it's basically, it's organic farming with a little bit more of, of a directive towards nutrient cycling and um, working in balance. 
It's not just throwing some organic fertilizers on the ground and some compost and calling it good. There's involves cover cropping, green manure cover cropping, and a whole bunch of other things. But it's basically a, a regenerative cycle. It just goes around and around. We want to foster that. So farms that are working in the direction that I'm working in are considered regenerative farms. So organic farms, many of them are regenerative, but many of them are not, you know, because they're just buying nutrients from somewhere and then putting them in the soil. And even organic nutrients are heavy, like green sand is a non-renewable resource. It's running out of the planet, but it's a great source of potassium for organic farmers. We've been using it for my whole, whole 37 years, practically. I mean, I haven't used it in the last five years, but it's very constant organic fertilizer. It takes petroleum to mine it. It takes petroleum to ship it to you. It's not really regenerative. Regenerative is that cycle utilizing the atmosphere, plants, and the roots of plants, and then the minerals in the plants. So that cycle is what we're trying to get going, not just let's throw some organic fertilizer down and call it and get certified as organic and call it organic. It's a little bit, a little bit more complex. Utilizing plants that you're probably not going to make money off of, but are building the soil. Okay. All right. Sorry if it's a little convoluted. Um, soil organic metal is crucial because it it's one of the things that the soil uses and its organisms are going to break down and supply to your uh, to the plants. Organic matter is just what it sounds like. It's it's organic matter. It's something that was once living. Okay. So anything that was once living, as it decays and it gets in the soil, it can become organic matter, okay? You know, we have very low organic matter in our soil. If we did a soil test, you know, outside, we right outside the front lawn here in P-Town in the library, I'd venture to say we'd be like 0.03% organic matter, okay? A little bit of roots growing on the top that decay. But, you know, ultimately, you know, you want to get five, six, seven, eight, ten percent 10% organic matter as the physical constitution of your soil, okay? Getting to 10% organic matter on Cape Cod is would be very difficult, okay? Because like I said earlier, it oxidizes because of the, all the extra oxygen and stuff in our soil. So we really need to constantly be adding organic matter back into the mix, okay? And that is in the form of many different things. We're about to get into compost and mulch, and those are some of them, okay? But we need to do this every single season, two or three times a season and utilize the right, uh, d you know, different combination of organic matter to create different microbes and different things. So it's not just, let's just throw down some a bag of compost that we buy at the, at the hardware store and call it good. There are, that's just very narrow minded. We need to like broaden that perspective and go for a, a diversity of uh, organic matter contents. And a, so therefore developing a diversity of, bacteria and fungi. I'm going to say bacteria and fungi because they're like really, really important. There are a lot of other microorganisms out there that do work too, but it's mainly bacteria and fungal. Um, and so those are the two that I'm going to talk about. So aggregates um, is, a, is a soil term where it takes uh, organic matter and uh, exudates, which is now going to be kind of like a glue, and they're going to kind of clump it together creating macro pore space in between. So soils that are like clay, like in Northern California, with the, you know, with organic matter getting added to it, that's how you're going to naturally break up and get that soil more open and what's called friable. Okay. So that water can get through, you know, so to do that, you have to have aggregates form with the organic matter. So once again, you need plant roots to get the ac exudates to make that kind of gluey gum that, that creates the aggregates. It basically just gets a whole bunch of particles and clumps them up together. And then bacteria and everyone feed on there and everyone's groovy and the water gets in and air is the key thing to pore space. Micro pore space has very little air. Um, nutrients are cycled very slowly. They also hold on to nutrients, but they're recycled very slowly. Where in our case, we have a lot of macro pore space, which is a little too much burning up excessive uh, organ uh, organic matter. So we're looking for that middle ground. Okay, that's called loam. Kind of difficult to get loam soil on Cape Cod, um, but you can go buy some farm in America somewhere or land and get a soil sample and boom, I've already got loam. So it does exist on its own, but um, not on Cape Cod and not really in New Jersey where I grew up. 
Okay, so the, yeah, the aggregates help contain uh, containing pores that retain water and aerate soil, allowing carbon dioxide to exit the soil and then uh, oxygen to enter. Keeping that living soil, that soil food web going. It needs air, it needs to move. Um, it needs the right pH, it needs the right nutrients. Okay, compost. So, any soil questions? Yes. So, when you say you have to do this several times a year, I know nothing about gardening. So, like, how how do I make sure that it gets in the soil? Am I tilling the soil? Like, how do I layer? It's a great question. And layering is a very you almost answered your own question. Um, I know I'm a no-till farmer now, so I I plowed fields. I've Rototilled, like I can't even tell you how much I've done that. I've harrowed and dissed and I've trashed soil. Um, when I became a Korean natural farmer, I stopped tilling. And not that's not totally true. I'm about 80% no-till on my farm. I'm transitioning over. But tilling is your conventional way of doing it. Um, digging with a, a shovel, a, pitch, a garden fork, not a pitchfork, but a garden fork. Um, garden forks are better than a shovel. It has less surface area and it doesn't damage the worms as much. So basically every time you stick something in the soil, whether it be a plow or a harrow or a shovel, you're slicing and dicing bacteria and fungus and earthworms and amoebas, and you're actually killing life. Okay. So here we are trying to build life, but the act of tilling is actually harming the life, you know? Um, so like, Ever seen those little like mantis tillers anywhere? Have one of those? Ever seen one of those little things? It's like a little tiny rototiller, but it's on a small motor and it's like this and it's got these little like things and it like, it just destroys your soil. You know, it's like, it's just an awful thing. Um, it doesn't get deep enough. Um, is it important to till? Yeah, there's times when you need, you know, I'm working with a friend of mine who's moved back from China. He's uh, an incredible farmer and a scientist. Um, and you know, he's taking over an old hay field and going to turn it into his, he's a his PhD in er, Chinese uh, plants and herbs. And he's a Chinese uh, guy, uh, herbalist from Truro, but that's where he studied. And uh, they're going to be growing a lot of medicinal herbs in America, in Western Mass. So yeah, on his farm, we're going to, we're going to flip the field. We're going to get the plow out. We're going to flip it. We're going to harrow it. We're going to probably get the perfecta out, which is another cool little machine. And then we're going to, you know, he's going to, you know, get it going and then put it in a cover crop. Okay. And we'll talk about cover crops in a minute, but, um, and then he's going to go no till because that he knows he's already learned in his life um, from farming in uh, China, how important it is to nurture the soil. If you till the soil with machinery, you're not nurturing the soil. You might help yourself a little bit by incorporating stuff and by, getting a clay soil a little bit more loose and friable, but ultimately it's not the best thing. So if you're at home and you have a home garden, a garden fork is better than a shovel. Okay. It's going to do less damage to the soil. Um, and that's not a pitchfork. That's pitchforks are for pitching hay and stuff. This is a flat, you know, not as wide as a pitchfork. Um, a garden fork is what they're called. I think that's what they're called. <laughs> Pretty sure. Um, so compost is decomposed organic matter. What kind of organic matter? Anything that was once living, okay? Coons killed some chickens yesterday on our farm. Where did it go? The parts that were usable were eaten by humans and dogs and the rest of it went in the compost, okay? You always hear no meat in a compost pile, right? But everyone hears that all the time, right? But farmers have been composting cows and horses and everything you could think of for centuries okay if it was once living it could be composted okay if you're afraid of rats then don't do it if you know if there's things like that i don't really mind rats because they go in the compost and they turn it up you know and if they can they need to eat too you know so um it's really a matter of your own preferences but um generally speaking you're always going to hear no meat in a compost and that's just false you know that's a that's the gardener world you know, talking about small home compost and they don't want to encourage raccoons and possums and things like that. But in the big picture, raccoons and, and possums are going to stir things up. They're going to poop. They're going to pee. They're all that stuff is going to add to the, to the mix, you know? So um, 
decomposed organic matter, that's what compost is, but it's decomposted. It's not just raw chicken and raw, you know, broccoli stems. Okay. It's, uh, it is an eggshells and coffee grounds, right? So, um, it has to go through a decomposition before it's actually called compost. Okay. And there's some numbers associated with that. Well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, so specifically made compost inoculate the soil with diverse uh, microbiology. Even your own home compost, where you're taking some of this in there and a little of this and a little of that, and maybe you're getting some manure from your friend and whatever, and you mix it in there, you are bringing bacteria and things in there that's adding diversity to that soil, okay? There's you know a, a trick that we do, which we're actually bringing um, indigenous microorganisms into our thing. But the goal is to get a diversified um, compost with a lot of different ingredients in there. So you get lots of different types of um, uh, diverse microbiology with those ingredients you're adding. So actually adding meat is a, is a, not a bad idea because it can bring in some of those bacteria in microbiology. Carbon-nitrogen ratio. Does anyone remember the carbon-nitrogen cycle? No? Some people. Um, the carbon nitrogen ratio is extremely important for all of us. We wouldn't be here without it. Okay. Um, this is the process of the forest high carbon, some nitrogen breaks down everything. Okay. It has to be in a ratio. If you ever, you've probably put a pile of leaves, just leaves on the ground. And then the next year, there's still a lot of leaves there, right? Hasn't really broken down yet. I mean, down in the bow, there's a little bit of leaf stuck mold going, but generally speaking, a pile of leaves by itself is going to sit there and not do very much. It's like pure carbon, okay? It needs nitrogen to break down the carbon, okay? It needs the ratio, okay? So the carbon-nitrogen ratio is important in the soil for normal soil everything, but in the compost, it's super important that we get it the right balance, okay? Too much nitrogen and it will go anaerobic and not be good. Okay, so when I'm talking about compost right now, I want to, yeah, I got to delineate. I'm talking about aerobic compost, okay? not anaerobic compost. Aerobic compost means with air. And in the process of aerobic compost, we get bacteria called thermophiles, okay? They're, they're heat producing bacteria that break down the carbon material and the material in your soil, in your compost. Um, so we need air in there, okay? That's why when you put a pile of like broccoli stems and all your kitchen waste and you just let it sit there, it takes forever to break down. And you never really get compost because there's not, there, you're, you've locked out the air. You need air. It needs to be turned. There's some tricks you can do so you don't have to do so much turning, but it needs oxygen. Without it, the thermophiles can't live. And then you go anaerobic. Not that anaerobic is necessarily bad, but it's not as quick and efficient as thermophilic anaerobic piles. So um, the carbon nitrogen ratio is the basis of your, of your compost pile. Okay. This is the thought process you need to have in your head when you start to make a compost. Okay. How often would you suggest turning it? It's done by the temperature. It's a very good question. Um, so be, it's a lot of people will get it, their compost to 180 degrees in the center. They have compost thermometers. If you want to geek out, get one. They're fun. Um, the real cool ones are really long, so we can have big, huge piles. My compost piles are the size of this room, practically. But we can, you know, 180 is like where everyone's like, yeah, that's when you flip. And that's true. But personally, I go at like 120 because after 120, we start to see fungal die off and bacteria getting killed off by the temperature. So in Korean natural farming, our sweet spot is 120, okay? It might not get rid of all the weed seeds you want to kill off because weed seeds can be killed by the heat. So um, it might not get all the weed seeds. It might not, you know, do, it might, you know, break down a little bit slower or whatever. But for me, I'm at 120, 130. But if you read the books, it's going to say 180, okay? Um, all right, so a CN ratio of 10 to 1 is considered compost, okay? It's broke down. To a 10 to 1 but we don't you don't can't start a pile at 10 to 1 because it's not decomposed yet so we need a little bit more in ours um yep all compost is not created equal like i said diversity is key just like in everything else in our life diversity is totally key 
We need different color people. We need different genders. We need everything in the world to make it go around, right? We need labs and we need little pugs, right? We need all the diversity we can get, okay? Including in your compost pile, okay? Broccoli stems would go great, you know, needs grapes and this and that. And, you know, manure brings in other bacteria and things, you know, that aren't in normal piles. So all compost is not created equal. I would suggest adding fish to yours if you could get it. Um, there's a lot of it around. Um, and that's a real high nitrogen source. So um, we're going to be talking about carbon nitrogen ratio and compost next. So um, there's great graphs on the internet. You can learn about what, what is the carbon nitrogen ratio of straw? What's the carbon nitrogen ratio of broccoli stems? What's the carbon nitrogen of, of, of coffee grinds? What is the CN ratio of everything? There's, it's all there. There's a cool little graphs. And when you start mixing things in, that's when you got to start thinking about it. That's the time, okay? Compost risks, potentially excessive nitrogen, not likely, but um, you can also, important to cover your compost pile um, as it gets towards the end of its process. When it's really actively cranking, I don't cover it, but as it's towards the end, I cover it because I don't want to leach out whatever nitrogen and phosphorus I've gained through this process of decomposition. Um, so, um, that depends on your ingredients. That depends on your CN ratio and how and how on it you are for flipping and turning it. And um, I can also tell you that there's a there's a volume that matters. Okay, I'm not a fan of those small little things that the black things that people have. That's not enough volume in my mind to get a good carbon nitrogen ratio. I, mass produces heat that the thermophilic bacteria work so. I'm like a minimum size compost I would have is about a four by four by four pile. Okay. Pallets are great because it's four by four by four. So um, the other reason why as, as a, as a home gardener, um, pallet compost bins, you can look, there are a million, I'm sure DYI things on the internet, but sometimes they'll, you'll see a description of them and there'll be a pallet on the ground. And sometimes you won't see that. I want one on the ground. And then the next layer that I put on there is branches, okay? So I'm getting air from underneath, goes through the pallet and goes through the twigs and the branches and then gets to my cake recipe, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute because it compost is like making a cake. So um, I find the pallet uh, compost bins to be the most effective. You have one bin here and right next to it, you have a second bin, okay? And you make your thing, you get your temperature to 180, you pick it up and you flip it all over to the second bin, okay? And then if you want a third bin, that would be your finished pile would go there, okay? So you have a, a third bin that now has the finished compost where it's broken down, covered with plastic, and then, you know, covered with whatever you can to keep the, the moisture off of it. And then um, the other two working, okay? So um, the components of creating compost here it is. It's like baking a cake, guys. It's like you got to it's like a recipe. OK, um, ideally, you're looking for a carbon nitrogen ratio of 20 to 1 to 30 to 1. OK, that's that. And by finding those graphs and I probably should have thrown it on here, but looking at what your sources are, you know, are you lucky enough to get some Natasha Hills horse manure or not? Do you, you know, do you have, you know, you're buying compost in some finished compost to add to a compost pile? You know, you want to look at all of your ingredients. OK. But that's 20 parts carbon to one part nitrogen, okay? Kitchen scraps are nitrogen, okay? Leaves, if it's brown, it's carbon. If it's green, it's nitrogen, okay? Grass clippings. What happens when you put a pile of grass clippings on the ground? It sits there and goes anaerobic and doesn't do much, okay? So that's just pure nitrogen. Mix that with a big pile of leaves and then boom, poof, they all go away in a year, you know, or even less. So... Um, the carbon nitrogen ratio is super important. So there's your carbon. These are the things you need for your compost. You need carbon, you need nitrogen, you need water. Why do you think you need water? Any guesses? What's the what's the little microscopic guys that are in the soil that are, are breaking things down? Living life, right? All life needs water. All bacteria need it, okay? Um, they can't do, the thermophilic bacteria can't do their work unless they have some moisture. So when you're making your compost pile and I'm making layers 
of adding some nitrogen, some carbon, some nitrogen, some carbon, and then I add a spray a little water on. You know, so you don't want it running damp because then it goes anaerobic. But you want to give it some um, water. pH is important. Okay, so for me, I've got a lot of compost piles that are you that are you know fully composted. I'll take that and inoculate my new compost piles. I'm bringing in the bacteria and all the good stuff. I'm also bringing in pH buffers to help buffer the pH of my compost ball because depending on your ingredients, it can be super acidic or super alkaline, okay? Once again, a compost pile, the pH is important for the bacteria, okay? Most of these bacteria are wanting to work at that same 6.3 to 6.8 range. It's all very well figured out with evolution. So um, it will buffer itself over time, but if you really know you're putting a lot of acidic stuff in this pile because that's what you have, pine needles and fish heads and all this other stuff, add a little limestone into it, okay? Add a layer of limestone. Limestone is calcium carbonate and it raises the pH up. But just a little sprinkle. If you don't have finished compost, then I would definitely add a little limestone. Give it, Get that pH to where the uh, microbes wanna go. You need microbes. Once again, inoculating it. If you don't have co finished compost, go out in the forest, get, go find that little leaf pile that's underneath the tree, pull that up, dig up a little, take a little bit. Don't take too much. Tread lightly. And, you know, I should be careful what I say, but take that leaf mold, it's called, with that mycelium and those bacteria and throw it in your compost, okay? You need to inoculate it. Or you can go to the store and buy compost starter, which is full of all sorts of different bacteria. And most of them are dead and it's a waste of money, but you can throw that on there and try to inoculate it that way. I do something completely different. I'm catching microorganisms in the forest using a substrate of um, El Dente rice in a special little box. And we put it in the forest under virgin land. And we're taking the diversity of the forest and we inoculate that El Dente rice with the organisms. Mainly, we're all mainly looking for fungal stuff. And then we take that and we mix it with brown rice, I mean, brown sugar equal proportions and we make something called so it's indigenous microorganisms are what we're capturing in the soil out in the, in the in the forest and then we're bringing them back into our soil through a process it gets to so imo2 is with the sugar that puts it in stasis and then you have imo2 it's just held there you, you're actually it you can have imo2 on your shelf so it's this rice mixture and all the different microorganisms mixed with brown sugar it does reverse osmosis and takes the water out of the microorganisms and holds it there until you mix it with some water and then it gets going again. It's amazing. So then you make IMO3 and then IMO4. And then if you're lucky enough, you make IMO5 and all that's how we're, you increase the population as you go along from a little tiny thing of fungi and bacteria this big to IMO5 piles, which is the size of this room. Okay, And then you can volume up, you know, acres, hundreds of acres, hectares, whatever you need, right? Yes. I have a person asking in the chat what the pH of the compost pile should be. 6.3 to 6.8. 6.3 to 6.8. Yeah. yeah. Predominantly being, yeah. You can tweak it if you're trying to get a more bacteria dominant compost or if you're trying to get a more fungal dominant. But you would have to be geeking out pretty hard to want to do that. <laughs> like things like brassicas, like cabbage family, okay? They like a bacterial dominant dominant compost. But per, by more, you know, basically for the most part, fungal is what we're looking for, okay? Um, the fungi communicate with the bacteria. It's not like the, there's no bacteria there. It's just that the fungi have a way of communicating with through the root exudates and the plants and really directing things, okay? Are ashes good for compost? Ashes are good for compost. They are a source of potassium, okay? And they buffer the, they'll raise your pH because there's calcium in there. So it's a very fast acting way. So too much can be too much and you can go alkaline very quickly. So a little bit of ash is definitely good. Um, a little bit of ash spread on your garden is good throughout the winter. Let it break down and start to balance out your soils too. And just to confirm, that's the same as biochar? No, that's not the same as biochar. No, biochar is... Definitely different. How do you 
aerate, aerate, aerate the soil without tilling. With a fork, garden. Just with the fork. Now, I've, now I've left the garden fork and now I've gone into a compost fork. Wider mm -hmm. tines, round, not flat. And you can get in there and work it. And then I personally just, well, actually, I just take a tractor and tractor it up and flip it over there. Then pick it up and just flip it over there and make a new pile. The nice beauty of the pallet system is that you've got everything contained. When I'm talking about pallets, a pallet on the ground and then three sides. So there's an open side in the front, but you can put chicken wire if you want to try to, I don't know why, but you could. I've seen a lot of people put chicken wire in the front, but and then you have two of them and then you just pick up that one pile when it gets to 130, in my opinion, 120, and then flip it and to throw it over. And then you just go back and forth. And what you're going to see is that four by four volume of, of, of uh, carbon and nitrogen you have is slowly over time going to start to shrink down because it's going to go to 10 to one. Okay. So it's going from 20, 30 to one to 10 to one, shrinking, things are breaking down. Um, and that's, you know, compost is not smelly. It smells delicious. It's like, if it's smelly, it's anaerobic. You need to turn it. If, 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 if you go to your compost pile and you're like, man, that thing stinks, then you're not turning your compost. You've gone anaerobic and you're getting meth methane bacteria doing their thing. And it's a whole different ball of wax. Can you turn it and bring it back? Anaerobic. Yes, definitely. And you can also, if it's really going anaerobic, I would add more carbon, <laughs> okay, um, to just kind of loosen it up, you know. Um, but that's why when I'm making, I mean, if I was a gardener and I would I would put my pallet, I'd have a pallet on the ground so air can get underneath the pallet and it goes up through the branches and in, in, in brush and the air gets right in there. So there's really good air circulation. And then the pallet has all those slits on the side. So you're getting air from the outside too. So it kind of does its thing without doing too much turning, but the turning is really regulated by the temperature. So you can learn, be like, you can stick your hand in there and be like, yep, that's time. You know, like old timers, you know, yep. You know, if it's too hot, you know, you'll pull your hand out and be like, oh, I'm going to burn myself. It's like, it literally, a pile can get up, can combust and just go on fire. You know, if there's so much carbon in, in a lot of, and if it's really, I mean, it can combust. So, you know, you can get well into the 200 range and literally burn your hand significantly by sticking it in. So you don't really want to do that. But, you know, old timers touch the outside of piles, you know. They know that I'm, if you know, some of the farmers I've that have mentored me over the years know their system so well that they know that it's like, oh, it's day eight. And we just did that. And, not, you know, and then as it goes along the line, like, oh, now it's day 27. Now it's time to flip. So it will slow down. That thermophilic activity will slow down over time. So it'll go through peaks, a little back peak and then go down and then go up. So it gets up in temperature, you stir it, it goes back down again. It's all about temperature regulating when you're at, when you're doing the turning as well as bringing in uh, air. When you're, when you're adding to your compost, should you break up the leaves in any way, like chop them up? It, it, you're, if you chop things up to smaller pieces, your compost will cook quicker. Is it necessary? Not at all. I mean, we can't, because I'm I'm getting a lot of, you know, I have some trusted landscapers that bring their stuff to me that I know are chemical-based um, organic matter. So, you know, I don't, we don't have time to run it all through a chipper shredder and kind of thing, but if you did, it would certainly speed up the process quickly too. I mean, it re you can make a compost in six, eight weeks if you've got all the right balance of all these things. You need that balance. It's key. pH is really important too, guys. I mean, like if the microbes don't have the right pH, they're not going to effectively be doing, they're going to work, but they're not going to work really at their optimum. So the, the, the recipe of your, of your cake is the most important component um, of your compost pile. Um, and then just checking on temperature. Um, worms are a great thing to add to a compost pile. I typically, if I'm going to add worms to my compost pile, that usually happens when I inoculate it with the old compost I have. I can dig into my compost pile, particularly, believe it or not, where those grapes were. And like just in one handful, I've got thousands and hundreds and hundreds of worms and just like this little bit and egg worm eggs and everything, you know. And I take that from that finished compost and I throw it in the new one and I've inoculated it with worms. OK, they're going to get there on their own. Likely they might, you know, um, but. 
inoculating with worms. If you're going to buy worms, you're buying something called a red wiggler. You're not getting earthworms and putting them in nuts. They belong in the earth. Red wigglers break down compost the best. Uh, many places to buy it. Um, there used to be some people selling it on the Cape, but I haven't seen that in a while. Um, you're welcome to ask me to bring some to one of my farmer's markets and I'll bring you some. Yeah. Okay, earlier you talked about a ratio of 10 to 1, and now here you're talking about 21. Is that because you're creating it? Yeah, exactly. So the 10 to 1 ratio is compost. Yeah, sorry, compost. That's okay. after it's decomposed. All that organic matter is decomposed, and it's now reading 10 to 1. That's when we begin to say that it's compost. Okay. Um, that's when it's officially compost. But the goal is to get it there. So the only way to get it there is to have 20 to 1 to 30 to 1. I'm a 30 to 1 kind of guy. You know, some, this, some of this comes from some textbooks. So it, it's that range between 20 to 1 and 30 to 1. And, but also important, it's also just the blend of things. You know, like the diversity is really important, you know. Um, you know, eggshells, you can't beat it. Coffee grinds, really important. Can really do some good things. Um, all right. Any other recipe questions? Yeah. Um, so I have a mostly kitchen scraps going right now. Mm -hmm. So so I'm thinking I should add some carbon. Yeah. But a lot of the carbon that I have around me, oak leaves, pine needles, mm -hmm. means high acidic, very yep. acidic. So is there a way to to, to limestone? Lime. Okay. Yeah, that's the quickest way. Unless you have finished compost, yeah, which then has all this biological activity going on and pH buffers, and you're adding that, and then that's going to help do it, naturally speaking, in that regenerative cycle. So the goal is to not to have to get a bag of limestone and put it down, or wood ashes if you have a wood stove. Is yeah. another, another way of doing it. But like we said to someone on the Zoom, really got to be careful. A little goes a long way, you know. Yes? So I have the regular compost pile, the triple one. Mm -hmm. um, and I also have focaccia that I use. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and rather than dig holes in my farm garden, mm -hmm. um, I throw focaccia in periodically, and it takes me longer because I just don't do as much focaccia. Um, but I throw that in. Is that hurting the pH? It's very acidic. No, it's it's actually helping buffer the pH. Yeah, it is acidic. Focaccia is acidic on its own right. But it, it's got so much stuff going on in there that's amazing that that helps create that pH buffer that you want, you know? It's not like throwing pine needles down, you know, or something like that. Um, but and I throw my red wigglies in there, and they seem to do fun. Oh yeah, they yeah they yeah they're gonna love it. You know, it's don't go away from pine needles and leaves. You know, there are better carbon sources locally around, and we'll get into that in a minute. But um, everything we 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 want to be composting everything we can, you guys. We don't want to like have piles of leaves everywhere and take it to the dump. I mean, we really want to compost, right? Like we need to regenerate our soil we need to balance our soils and as a as a planet we need to do this and as a human species so we could be healthier you know like if we're just pumping chemical fertilizers in the ground we're going to have diseases it's like artificially you know just taking food in the iv we need a balance the soil has to be in balance so we need to compost and as a gardener you have weeds you have tomato plants, you got, you know, there's all sorts of things that are created in your garden that shouldn't need to, what's not going in your belly and not going to an animal needs to go back into the soil and, and through compost is the best way to do it. Now you can layer, you can just throw it on the ground and let it rot and that's going to do the same thing. And technically that's called sheet composting where you just layer all this stuff down on the ground and let it go, you know? Um, so there are many, many types of um, compost. But that's, those are the main things that a compost pile needs. I threw worms in there because they are very great at breaking down organic matter. Um, their, um, their poop um, is the best in the world. You know, it's like the best poop ever. So um, it's in an aggregate form. You know, it's like just, it's such good stuff. So um, I threw worms in there. A lot of times you won't see, that's not a, a critical ingredient, but it's a good one. Um, who has a lot of worms? Horse farms, if you can find a pile of horse manure around, you'll typically see big piles of, of uh, red wigglers if you need. So if anyone you know, I mean, I'm not going to give names in Truro, but there are plenty of horse farms in Truro. You know, if you can just get a little bit. It also little... ends up at the dump. <clears throat> yeah, that's Ryan. Oh, I to call him out. Yeah. You can just yeah. Load yeah. Back in your yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as they keep it separate, because years ago I was working, I was the 
Ag Commissioner and the Truro Agricultural Com Com uh, Commission. And we're beginning a process of segregating our street sweeping, cleaning waste and putting it separate from all the other stuff in the dump in Churro. Okay. So that was when Paul Morris was the was the director of DPW in Churro. Things significantly changed, um, politically speaking, in Churro. And a lot of things changed, not always for the better at the dump. Um, and they went back to just mixing in the street sweepings with all the Christmas trees and the pumpkins and the things you bring down to that pile down at the churro dump all gets mixed in together now. And I would be very, very hesitant to put that on my soil. Well, I mean, manure is something to be told in the manure. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to talk in a minute about your source when we get to manure, because it's really important to know is there a lot of antibiotics in that manure? There's a lot, a lot of antibiotics in manure. So you really need to know who's managing the animals. Is it, you know, and what kind of grain and feed, you know, if you feed an animal lots of mod GMO modified grain and they poop it out, well, then you've got that situation there too. So it's complex. It's not an always perfect world, but to say the least. Um, oh, we're jumping right in there. Okay. Any more compost questions? No, so quick. So I'll go back. One. That seems to me yeah, it's like a big pile of leaves or a little bit of exactly. And that's the way to look. Think about it. Just visually think 20 part 20 parts of this to one part of that. So it's like real it, you can look at it volume wise, but also look at that chart you can get on the internet and see what is the CN ratio of this. Like if you're adding a lot of something and it's already 30 to one, then you don't need to, you know, you, you have to, you can alternate, you know. I mean, wait, wait till you see like oak leaves. You know, it's like 500 to one or something like that. It's, it's like you have to do a little math and a little like thinking, but think about it volume wise. Brown, lots. Green, little. Okay. And that's where most people's compost is too much green, not enough brown. That's, that's the number one problem why people give up on compost. Yes. How do you prepare the manure for the compost? Is Nothing. It, just throw it in. Just throw it in. Yeah. Just throw it in. It's just enough. I mean, everything for me gets somewhat late. Not for me. If I had a compost in my garden, I would be I would be making my pile initially. I'd get all my ingredients, including maybe some limestone if I didn't have the right pH or some wood ashes. And I'd be making layers, a little carbon, a little splash of limestone, a little water, with another layer of some, uh, let's put a little nitrogen and let's do some more carbon, maybe a couple branches in there to get some more airflow in the middle of the pile. And I just make a layer. And I just layer it all the way up. Would this be similar to what they term lasagna gardening? Um, yes and no. Lasagna gardening is layers, like a lasagna. Um, most lasagna gardens utilize cardboard, which has microplastic in it. We just found out about eight months ago. So... Cardboard is no good. In my opinion, after those white paper studies that were revealed, I think it was about maybe about eight nine months ago. Um, if you can find my Facebook stuff, I think I probably posted that white paper. But yeah, those of us in the regenerative world right now are getting away from cardboard um, due to the microplastics that are in there. Um, but yes, so that's the same thing. Like typically, they put a layer of cardboard down. This is on like bare soil. That you maybe want to turn into a garden later and then you start layering different layers of stuff same basic technique but a lot of times people think lasagna they they think cardboard particularly here because that's how it's been taught a lot you know when john hopkins was alive and um teaching a lot of people about lasagna gardening there was a lot of compost involved i mean cardboard involved and then we've done that with our school gardens here too so it's not like we're not you know we're we did the same thing so it's not like uh you know we're, we're all learning, right? So um, now we know that cardboard is probably not the best. Um, and I, I used it like for back to Eden gardening, just for the bottom layer. Yeah, just to, to smother out the weeds. To, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That didn't even think about it. I mean, I yeah, thinking. so that was how we did it for a long time. Like if I had new a new a new area I wanted to do, I'd cover with compost. I mean, cover with, with some bunch of weed mat. I mean, not weed mat, of uh, cardboard. You know, blocks out the sun, 
then I start piling stuff on top and I just let it rot. And then we just start planting, you know, and if I don't, you know, if I don't have time to get the lasagna thing to go and do the whole thing, then we just bring in finished compost on top of the carb and let it all rot. And then we start planting through it. Um, but I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Newspaper. Only if it's uh, white and black. White and black. Yeah. No color. No. Now, I don't know if you know the term bioremediation, but you can, in the world, we can bioremediate toxins in our soil including um, uh, printer's ink. Like, uh, what was his name? Not John Jevons, was it John Jevons? He was in Willis, he was a Harvard guy that went to Willis, California and was doing bioremediation with fungus and compost, horse, horse, comp, horse manure, and literally pouring printer's ink in these compost piles and remediating it into a carbon-based product with releasing water and things like that and making it totally inert and healing, you know, taking a toxic substance by remediate oil spills on the ocean. They spray bacteria on the ocean spills that breaks down the, the oil. I mean, by remediation is a phenomenal subject, but um, as far as composting goes, black and white only, I wouldn't use too much, you know, like, you know, just that ink gets me kind of weird thinking, but it's, it was once living, it was a tree. So do we want to waste it? No. So, you know, I would shred it if I was, you know, to use it. And if I was going to use it on the ground, like carb, like the cardboard, then I wouldn't shred it. I would just lay it out thick, but um, I'd be hesitant on going too, too much, but it's been approved by organic, you know, the powers that be, you know. Mm -hmm. What if we're close to the sea? What about the seaweed? Seaweed's phenomenal. Which kind? All kinds. All kinds. All kinds. All kinds. Yep. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second with mulch. Oh, okay. Any other compost questions? What do you got? When you're um, using fresh manure, it's yeah. been composted. Is there like so? It's um, not fresh if it's been composted. Well, when is it when is it ready if it's been composted to be placed in the garden? Like, how do you know? 120 days. 120 days. Yeah, from from fresh to when you can safely add it to your soil. So. Your 120 days is a compost pile is going to take 120 days, but if you're a certified organic farm, you're a hunt. It has to be 120 days. You can't add raw manure to organic fields. Yeah. There's some E. coli issues and you know all this other stuff. Um, oh, yep. Comfrey. Comfrey. I use it in all the time, and it's this kind of outlaw here. Do you use comfrey? I have comfrey all over my farm. Um, I use it once again, it, I use it in a Korean natural farming way now, you know, it, as what's called a fermented, um, uh, FF, uh, uh, fermented, I'm sorry, FPJ fermented plant juice. So I ferment it once again with brown rice, a little bit, you know, but, um, comfrey is an amazing biomass producer. It can put out volumes of, of biomass per plant, you know? So like if you incorporate that into your compost piles or you just cut it and let it rot, okay? It's gonna benefit your soil in many, many ways. It's got like, of course it has a lot of medicinal properties that people use it for. I use, I use the flowers in all my salad mixes because it's an incredible tasting flower. Um, almost cucumber-like, you know, it's really a delicious flour to eat. There's people make, you know, things, sobs, and all, all sorts of stuff. So comfrey is an amazing plant and it grows great here on Cape Cod. Um, and I would encourage it everywhere on your property to grow. Well, but the whole thing with the medicinal part of it is, then there's some studies that have done that it can cause liver cancer, which is why it became Many of these products are not legal in this country now. Hmm. And I yeah. was just shocked. Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about that. I, you know, I use the flowers for my, to eat, and then the rest of it just decays. You know, I don't, uh, I don't personally do anything with it. Um, you know, it ends up being another weed that then goes in my compost piles, you know, so. Um, but comfrey is also phenomenal root exudate producer. So what's going on underneath the ground with the comfrey plant is really quite good. And it can, it can really send those roots down and mine nutrients that are deep 
in there, down there, where other plants can't get to, and brings it up to the surface, and as it decays. So it's like it's a really good plant, and I also think it's one of the what's called a phytoremediator, where it remediates poisoned land. I think they they use comfrey for that too. So yeah, I would never shy away from comfrey in any respects. Okay, compost. Let's get to mulch. Mulch, you know, the point of mulch, a lot of people think is uh, to retain moisture and to keep weeds down, right? Um, it's really, really important that we don't have bare soil. You don't want to have your open bare soil. You always want to have some cover on. If you're not growing a living mulch, if you're not growing a plant that's acting like a mulch, you've got to have something down. Seaweed is a perfect example of that, okay? But even better than seaweed, well, it's, no, seaweed is just one of the great things. But we are so blessed to live where we live because we have salt marsh hay. Salt, salt marsh hay. The hay that washes up in our marshes um, has been used for generations on Cape Cod. Um, when churro, so after the king tides in March and the next big rain, everything was shut down in churro. And the people at the boat works, the sail yard, the all their fishermen, everyone would go in these really cool boats that they had built, these really shallow, fat, wide boats. I think the I think the National Seashore has like a boat on display somewhere in East Ham or something, but there were these, and you can see photos, go to the Churro, you know, historical thing and see photos of these cool boats. And they would heap the salt marsh hay up on these things, right? And then out in the marshes, they would build these big bins, right? And there's a few bins left. And out there still, you know, there's only a couple of legs or whatever, but then they would, everyone would fill the bins with this stuff. And then at low tide, then everyone would get all this salt marché and everyone would work, the, the school would stop, everything. Like the whole town would just collect salt marché and then fill the bins. And then throughout the rest of the year, the farmers in Churro would go at low tide to those bins on their horse and carriage, get the salt marché and use it as fodder. For their animals okay so it got cycled through all that whole process and mixed with urine and manure mainly sheep and cattle and horse but those are the main things and it's been a sustainable plant product that's been utilized here forever okay now a days when you pull up on the beach and you start raking it off someone's going to come up to you and tell them you're ruining the environment that you're you know, the little animals that live underneath it are now getting eaten and their erosion and you're going to hear all these stories but I go back to historically what's been done and it just, it's just, it's a cycle. And I can tell you right now, as I was driving here and I was at Blackfish Creek and some of those high tides we've had and those big storms, man, there is a lot of salt marché out there right now and it's going to be a bumper year. And I know people are already collecting. My friend Boz is like a... Down by the province center is right to the edge of the road. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I'm not going to tell you any of my spots, but there are definitely spots. Okay. There's some phenomenal spots that are very easy to access with your car or truck and just start filling it up, you know? Okay. So salt marsh, hey, is, do I have it on there? No, this is just what it is. All right. Let's go back to what mulch is. So we want to keep our soil covered at all times. Okay. There is a time in the spring where you want it uncovered if you're going to do direct seeding or transplanting. But if you've got a mulch, like salt marsh hay or something, um, even wood chips, whatever you have, this mulch, you can pull it apart and then you put your transplant in. If it's a direct seeded, we'll make a furrow and then have that open and then run the seeds down there like carrots or scallions or whatever we do. But I um, mean, then as they grow, then we push the mulch back over. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we really want to, um, we're trying to emulate nature again. We're, the leaves fall off the tree, they cover the earth, the process is starting. Um, it helps retain moisture in the soil, which is very important for Cape Cod. Um, it suppresses weeds. Is it the best thing in the world for suppressing weeds? It works good, great sometimes, depending on what you got. The nice thing about salt marsh hay is it has no terrestrial weed seeds. Okay, You have to be in a marsh to have salt marsh hay germinate. Okay, So if your garden soil, it's not going to germinate. If you go out and buy some hay you know, and throw it on there, particularly like Timothy hay or something, you are in for Timothy weeds like you wouldn't believe, okay? So, um, you know, compost the straw and hay first, get that thermophilic activity, breaks down the weed seeds, kills the weed seeds, and then add it to your soil. 
So I'm not saying straw is bad. I'm just saying I'd probably compost first. And that I'm totally learning from my years of experience. Like, you know, because, you know, Agway, oh, we got all this rotten straw. You want it? I'm like, sure, let's take it. And then, you know, I'm in trouble. Um, and also, you got to make sure it's good, clean hay because it could have Roundup on it. You know, there's, I, who knows? You know, you never know. Um, one of the things that it does is it creates a little habitat on there that's nice and slow, balanced. It's nothing, no extremes. Water's kind of constant. Temperature's kind of constant. Airflow's kind of constant. And that creates a habitat for the organisms to do their work, both macro and microorganisms. So microorganisms, something we can't see without a microscope. Macro, something we can't see. Earthworms, spiders, cinch bug, you know, all the other things that are decaying things, dung beetles, whatever we got. Um, so it becomes food. Your mulch becomes food for um, the microbes. The saprophytic uh, microbes will take carbon and digest it and turn it into plant ready uh um, food that is slowly released to plants over time. So uh, high carbon material can be broken down with saprophytic bacteria um, like wood chips and everything, you know, like it doesn't always have to be like, you know, mulch doesn't have to be that same carbon nitrogen ratio like compost. It can be just carbon, like, which is, you know, salt marsh A, you know, you bag mulch, you know, there's all sorts of mulches out there. Um, and I think that's, yeah, here we go. Okay, but my favorite kind of mulch it's called a living mulch, okay? Living mulch is just what it sounds like. It's a plant that covers the ground that's not a crop. So it's not like a, uh, it's not your tomatoes that's covering the ground. It's a plant that's growing underneath your tomatoes, okay? And that is doing all sorts of great things. First off, it's producing exudates. Second of off, um, it can, if it's the right type of, uh, I, you see the word alyssum, did I spell that right? Yeah, I think I spelled that right. So alyssum and thyme, right? Alyssum uh, is a great flower, kind of can be smell great too. It's a low growing little plant, white, very common white ones are, seem to be the best. But what they do is they give a home for beneficial insects to rear their young so that they can, the, you know, the green lacewing insect can raise its young from the nectar from the there, creating what's called an insectary and imp increasing beneficial insects that then go and eat your bad bugs, okay? So um, a mixture of a living thing is great. Clovers are nice, white ditch clover um, are really great for walkway spaces between your garden beds. You can have white clover there. Um, if you have children, little children, um, be careful of white clover because bees, you know, um, New Zealand white, uh, white clover and Dutch white clover are the ones we use as living mulches. They grow very low very prostrate to the ground so that your pepper plant, your eggplant, everything can grow. And the beautiful thing about clover is that's a specific type of uh, cover, living cover crop um, called green manure, okay? The reason why it's called green manure, that was coined by Sir Albert Howard, who's the father of organic farming in the world, pretty much. He, um, amazing man, um, saw that if you grow legumes, which can take atmospheric nitrogen. So our atmosphere is like 70 something percent nitrogen, but it's not in plant usable form. So plants can't absorb nitrogen through their leaves. Well, there's a few that can, but not many. Um, but these special bacteria, once again, live on the roots of the legume plants called rhizobia, and they create a, make colonies and they take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into plant usable nitrogen that then goes in the plant, okay? Alfalfa, clover, peas, beans, soybean. I mean, there's any leguminous plant, locusts, okay, um, are producing its own nitrogen, okay? So it's a really important component to building your soil is to use, get this free nitrogen, which is also equal to protein, like nitrogen and protein have a ratio together. So animals eat, you know, the alfalfa and they're getting protein from that, you know, and then we're getting the protein from them. So, um Green manures are specific. Clover is a very good um, one. My favorite green manure is hairy vetch. Um, it produces a lot of biomass. Um, so during the season, as it's growing, you, you cut it and let it just fall and rot, and then it will grow some more, and then I'll cut it and let it drop because um, it can get very tall and cover over your tomato plant. But a little, you know, a little hack with a machete or something puts it back down again. Um, all right, so 
living mulches are the best, hands down, the best mulch you can get. Even better, mixing in some green manures, some leguminous plants. Wood chips, bark, sawdust, all good, pure carbon for the most part. Um, will take a little bit more time to break down depending on its size. So a big wood chip is going to take a while to break down. If it's in sawdust form, it's going to go quicker. Um, bark usually goes a little bit quicker than a total wood chip, hardwood. Compost, you can use as mulch. If you've got 10 to 1 compost and it's been done, you're done. Straw, I have there. It's very common. People use it. Cardboard, got to take that off. Manure, this is where you want to be careful. You want to know your source manure. You want to know, is it highly, and a lot of antibiotics in there? Is there a lot of um, other pesticides and fungicides that are used to treat the animals um, in there? Um, GMO, there's just so many unknowns. So, you know, you really want to be careful that someone's not abusing, you know, most people are going to use some form of antibiotics, like on a, you know, many farms are going to have that uh, for their horses and stuff. But if, if it's used judiciously, that's one thing. But if it's really abused, you really don't want to use it. grass clippings, very high nitrogen, but also will smother. If you are going to use grass clipping as a mulch, you want to come in with that garden fork every so often and break it up a little bit, let some air in there, because it can create a little bit of a pocket where activity slows down. Um, so break, you know, very couple times a season, if you're going to use grass clippings, um, it will leach some nitrogen in the, the soil. Um, leaves and leaf mold is a lot of what we have. Salt marsh hay we went over. And then there's synthetic weed mat. It's plastic. Um, people, you know, it's called weed mat if you're a farmer. It's called landscape fabric if you're a gardener. But it smothers weeds. You know, it does its job. Um, and it is uh, considered a mulch because underneath it, more water retention, you know, temperature is not so fluctuated, a little evener. Um, and even underneath the plastic weed mat, you will get uh, good biological activity. I don't, I'm, I used a lot of it over, over my years. Um, it's a, it's a labor saving cost and weeding on our farms to use weed mat. It really does save a lot of time. Um, but I'm slowly weaning myself off of that plastic, uh, thing. Any questions on mulch? Yes. Can you just choose one mulch type or can you use... Mix it up if you want. More diversity. You know, more diversity. You know, my favorite one to use, living mulches, for sure. So you got, it's a little complicated. You got to get, you got to learn some tricks and things, but um, second would be compost, finished compost, put on real thick, and and then salt marsh hay is... Uh, and then there are we have eelgrass, right? You know, the, the stringy eelgrass seaweed that by the Holiday Inn, or I don't know what the name of that hotel is anymore. What, what's the Holiday Inn called? What's it called? The Harbor Hotel. The Harbor Hotel. You know, go down there. There's all sorts of piles of black stringy seaweed. It's If you chop it up into small bits, it'll break down quick and be good. Um, it comes from the sea. The sea is an amazing uh, entity for us. It has all the minerals known to earth on earth are in seawater. So all that stuff is really good for your soil and bacteria and for the for the fungal stuff. Um, if you put that eelgrass as a mulch, not much is going to grow through it. OK, so it's really good for perennial gardens like where I know my, you know, rosemary is going to be growing. I can see it. I can pile it up that slowly breaking down salt marsh, uh, I mean, eelgrass. Eelgrass doesn't mat down. It does mat down, but it's not quite like grass clippings. It still gets air in there. So you don't have to mix it up. So um, you know, what else we have? Bladder rack we have a lot of around here. Um, I would compost it for sure. I would use it as mulch. Um, so seaweed is, is a good one. I don't know why it's not on there. It should be. Um, all right, any other mulch questions? We are closing in on the people. All right, soil fertility management. This is the, this is the, let's summation all of it, okay? What do we need? We gotta keep it covered, okay? We gotta keep the soil covered. We don't need extremes, freezing and thawing in the wintertime, not good. Destroys the tilt of the soil, the health of the soil. We wanna keep everything covered. Amendments, if your garden needs some phosphorus and some potassium, some calcium, we have amendments to add. You want to get things in balance, okay? Um, pH is one of them is an important fertility manager. We talked about if it's in this range of pH six point three to six point eight, 
most of the macronutrients and micronutrients are available in plant form, okay? Plant ready form that can get through the roots, uh, the, the root membrane. Um, inoculate your soil with microbes and other soil biology. I put IMO on there. It stands for indigenous microorganisms. That's what I do when I go out. It's not taking like, I wouldn't put that rice capture on like a compost pile. It's not diverse enough. You want to go to the forest. Ideally, Master Cho, who created this style of farming, was like, you know, you go to the 500 feet up in the, up in the mountains, you find the oldest tree you can get, and that's where you collect it. You know, like, so um, you want to go to undisturbed places. That's the key. Humans, we've trashed the earth. You want to go where humans don't go. Okay, you don't want to get collect uh, uh, indigenous microorganisms on the trail. You want to go off the trail into the woods. Okay, and then you want to diversify too. We don't just have one IMO collection. We have many different ones. I've got them from the Cedar Swamp Trail. I've got them from the dunes out in Provincetown. I've got them like all over the different place. And then they go in and get mixed up together into IMO uh, three and four or five. So um, diversity is key. Um, you can inoculate your soil with compost. That works. That's another way of doing it. Water is very important for all organisms. Um, that's an important part of soil fertility. Organic matter. Without organic matter, the engine shuts down. Okay. So a lot of this is going to slow down if that compost that Bayberry put in your yard 20 years ago is gone. It's not doing that same thing. It's not, the wheels aren't moving, okay? And then last, but definitely not least, is living plant roots, okay? Something growing is really important. Getting those exudates and all that stuff we've just talked about, the whole cycle of the soil is all about the plants, okay? Photosynthesis it goes right back to, taking, you know, carbon and uh, sunlight and, produce, and uh, water and producing plants. Oh, there's my old plant stand. There's some photos. That's one of my greenhouses we were experimenting in during my salad mix. There's another little one. There's one of my older ones that's no longer there. Um, so you see the weed mat there, right? It just makes for a lot easier. Weed mat was really a nursery thing. Now it's becoming a little bit more of a crop agricultural thing, but um, it was used to keep, you know, we could put pots on the ground and we wouldn't get roots, weeds into the pots that we sell. There's one of my greenhouses, my little guys. That looks like Shingiku growing. There's one of tomato crop of mine. I sell a lot of tomatoes. This is, a, this is if I was a gardener, now I'd minus the weed mat, but this is how I would do it. Right here, put a fence up, keep the critters out, drip irrigation. You wanna keep your leaves dry. Never water plants in your garden after three o'clock in the afternoon. You want your plants to go into the night dry, okay? When your landscaper comes, puts on the automated sprinkler system, they do it all wrong. They don't really know what they're doing. So you wanna make sure that, you know, it comes out at the right time. After three o'clock, you want everything dry. You need it to dry off to create low, less humidity pockets, which are going to keep diseases down. Okay. Very important. Keep the soil, the water off of the leaf that can do sunspots. That can do all sorts of fungal diseases can spread in the water. Drip irrigation. Sprinklers sprinkle, they hit the ground. And if you look at a, at a microscope or something, the, the soil that could shoot up from the soil from that droplet goes up. Soilborne organisms, septoria, blights, all the tomato blights, so many soilborne organisms that are not good for your plants are from raindrops and from that stuff. So minimize overhead sprinklers if you can. Drip irrigation, expensive initial upfront cost, but a really great way of keeping your soil um, done. This, of course, gets this garden. These are um, an old client of mine. They, of course, put salt marsh hay on top when they're done. This is when we were building it. Um, and now they don't use the weed mat anymore and they just have salt marche. There's some of my turnips and there's me, Dave's greens. That's actually from one of my wife's road races. That's a porta potty <laughs> at the women's race in Boston. That's what she used to run, but I had to take a picture of it because I thought it was kind of cool. Um, all right. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much to the Provincetown Library. You can see it used to say Churro Library. And then I didn't get rid of it. I didn't backspace enough and put a capital P. But.
we are collaborating. This is actually this is I believe it or not, I've taught I've taught hundreds of classes all over the Cape. This is my first time at Robinson Library. Um, thanks for all the Zoom help. Um, I want to thank all my teachers for teaching me. Thank all you guys for coming and making this on. Thank all my people online. Um, and then I'd like to dedicate all of the effort that I've done today to all sentient beings. May they use this information to help create a better planet. And that's um, because I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. um, what about what we track in the house. Soil is what we're talking about. Uh, uh, um, what about containers? It's a good, very good question. It's about volume, okay? Um, can you have a living soil that's regenerating and really active with bacteria and fungus going on? Yes, you can. But we, I'm actually, a lot of people will say it has to be 30 gallon container and up. I'm of the 50 gallon reality. To have a biological soil in a container, you really need to, um, to have volume, okay, mass for everyone to to get that to, the whole process to work, but adding compost if you get a good big pot and you're really getting it going, a little compost every year keeps the thing going. Um, you know, indigenous microorganisms add a little bit, you know, extra. Um, there's something called effective microorganisms EM. You can buy it anywhere. Um, it's another way of getting organisms into your soil. Um, so yes, you can. But it's got to be big, and if I, I mean, I would really say a hundred gallon, really, like where I'd probably go. But I don't want to scare you off. You know, a fifty gallon pot is a pretty good size pot. You know, it's the size of my yacht. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you want to be real careful on like nutrient availability. Like in a pot, when you water it, those nutrients are getting flushed out. So you can't just like fertilize in the beginning of the spring and think it's going to make it th through the whole year. So it's it's not. So even if you get like super hippie groovy soil to put in there right like the finest whatever you know or you know from maine lobster compost whatever it's gonna it's gonna degrade down to stuff in no time without biological activity so you're gonna have to add slow release organic nutrients okay to keep a crop really thriving and then that soil can be reused but remember like you're just taxing it over time so you know, a couple seasons, yes, but you really want to, after a couple seasons, the airflow is no good. You want to break it up, you know, so, you know, maybe two or three seasons would be max, and then I would refresh with new soil. And adding compost, too, is important. Yeah. And food scrap collection is coming to Provincetown. I heard that. At the transfer station in Washington. Yeah, I heard that. And I hope they do the right things with it. Yeah. In Truro, they, they truck it away at an yeah. expensive cost. I heard the Black Earth people are coming, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Hopefully, um, you'll get as a Provincetown resident able to get some compost. That's the yeah, that's the cycle that doesn't work in Truro, you know. Oh, okay. So, um, all right. Any other questions? I kept you longer than I was supposed to. So. Just a reminder to everybody: uh, Dave's next program is going to be at the Truro Public Library. So you'll be available on Zoom, and if we can, if our room is free, I'll try to have it up here. If you don't have ability to get to the Truro Library. That's February 8th. It's planned crop rotation and seeds. And that will all that's Truro Library at 5 30, February 8th. Next and Thursday. And if you need a flyer, again, I have them up here. It has additional information about upcoming programs that we have. And um, please come and take a look at all of our seeds that we have available at our seed library. So thank you for coming today. Thank you all. Another round for Dave. Yep. Oh. oh good try to come yeah next it's so it's the next three thursdays is the way it works February. so yeah we got yeah. Turo next week then we're back here the one after that oh, and back in Turo again so. yeah, you're welcome. this might sound like a strange question but about 30 years ago promise how was selling these round yeah Honeybee kind of yep, yep. Yeah. we still have one that's all broken down and everything. We were thinking about getting 
Yeah. I think I mean, it's broken down like it's no longer. It's like it's, no, it's actually broken down. Yeah, yeah, like the, over time. Yeah, the plastic is well, broken. Right. Yeah. What, what about the square ones the that have the? Uh, it's a, for me. It's about volume. Yeah, it, 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 we have space and no space. Yeah, so, yeah. But for me, a four by four space is the best. Yeah, and that's that's really gonna break things down the best. If it's a smaller size, you really want to focus on your ratio. It's sure. about like this. Yeah, I know which ones you're talking about. It's close to enough, but not quite enough. 80 gallon, I think it is. Yeah, so it's not quite big enough, in my personal opinion, yeah. but it just means you have to be a little bit more honest. Yeah. 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 Making sure that it's turned up. Right. Making sure that that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, not just like right. it's right. made I'm sure you've noticed that sometime over the years, I've got all the wet. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, we've screwed up a couple of times with it. Yeah. yeah. But um, the thing of it is, is that the square ones that I'm finding online, there's no base. You don't need a base. You don't need a base. Yeah. So in other Actually, words, it's better not that mice. Yeah, I know. They're going to they're going to put them in a bee. It's going to have your pocket like that. Right. The yeah. yeah. honeybee yeah. one. Had a plastic. Yeah, that's, that's that separates that from the world. Yeah. You want them. You want the air to get in. Air to get in there. Also, there's bacteria and worms in here that are there. So we have a lot of red wigglers. Good, good. Keep that going. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. 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 yeah, as much space as you can get. Yeah. I've been meaning to make it. I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. 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 Ye